Well, we see a daf bem chet on the aleph. A word is a word. Mishe para me anshei dor hamabu. Where we're going to see that that sometimes a lack of ethical integrity can be worse and more toxic for a society than criminal activity. Uh, we think that criminal activity is the worst, and then there's the, kind of the gray area of. Of, of integrity and questions of ethics. But for a society, lack of ethics can be more of a problem even than crime. We've established a machlokes, Rabbi Yochanan and Resh Lokish, about how a transaction is consummated when it involves movable property. Our gold and Rolex example, does money do it? Is kesef kone, once the money is handed over, does that clinch the deal? Or does there actually have to be delivery? Does the person have to hold the watch in his, in his hand? And Rabbi Yochanan says that Midoraisa, according to the Torah, once you've paid for it, the, the deal is clinched. Nobody can pull out of the deal anymore, even if delivery hasn't come about yet. But the Chachomim, the rabbis, decided that paying is not sufficient. You've got to actually deliver. Until there's delivery, either side could pull out of the deal. Rabbi Shimon says not either side could pull out of the deal, but the, the seller can pull, pull out of the deal. And Reish Lokish says that Kesef doesn't work even Midoraisa. There's no Kenyan Kesef. Money never clinches the deal in matters of movable property. There has to be delivery. Until there's delivery, there's no thought that that could possibly clinch the deal. The Gemara goes on, we had in our Mishnah, even that is so, that money doesn't clinch the deal, payment doesn't clinch the deal. According to Rabbi Yochanan, it's Midrabona, that's according to the rabbi, it's according to Reish Lokish, that's the law of the Torah. Either way, paying for something before there's delivery, you, you could still get out of the deal. So the price goes up, you do a deal, payment is made, the price goes up and the seller says, no, I'm not doing, I'm not going ahead with the deal, I'm, I'm pulling out of the deal. You can do so. However, said the Mishnah, there is still a Misha para. If a person does such a thing, then we apply a, so to say, a curse that there is. Avalamru, Misha para me anshe dora mabulu mi dora flaga hu atidli para mi Misha eno omed bidibiro. He who extracted payment from the generation of the flood and of the Tower of Babel, he will extract payment from somebody who doesn't stand by his word. The Gemara goes on to discuss, is that according to Reish Lokish or according to Rabbi Yochanan? And so the Gemara says, I understand if technically there's a requirement mid or raisa, once you've paid the money, the deal is done. The Chachomim come along, the rabbis come along and they say, we're saying, for the various reasons we discussed yesterday, we're saying, no, the deal is not done until there's delivery. However, since Midorai says, since according to the Torah, the deal is done, I understand that the rabbis say, and however, if you don't, if you don't stick to your word after payment is made, then there's a Misha para, then there's this curse. But if payment is not a Kenyan at all, it never was a Kenyan. The Torah doesn't require, it's not the way you clinch a deal in, in movable property. In movable property, the deal is sealed when delivery is made. Until delivery is made, the deal is not done. If that's the case, wh wh why is there a Misha para? Why is there anything ethically wrong even with it? And that's what we're looking at here. And what, what concerns me in the Salsugi is trying to understand this gray area. Technically, delivery has to be made. Ethically, if money has been paid and delivery hasn't been made, you should still stand by your word. And if not, there's this curse. What kind of a curse? God will extract payment from you like the people of the flood. My goodness, the people of the flood were so terribly corrupt. If legally you're allowed to back out if you haven't taken delivery, it's just the Rabbon and however we want to learn it, or according to Reish Lakish, it's not even, not, not, there's, no, there's no requirement at all. Until there's delivery, you're allowed to back out. Why Misha Parah? Why is there this terrible curse that a person who doesn't stand by his word will be treated like these terribly corrupt people? God destroyed the entire world because of the corruption of the people of the time of the flood. Is that how you would talk about somebody who's doing something which he's legally entitled to do? It's just ethically it's not, it's not so right. Says the Gemara because of Dvorim, because he's not standing by his word. You're right, legally he's allowed to do it, but there's another requirement of being honest and standing by your word. So even though, according to the law, he's allowed to pull back, but he said he's going to do the sale. Once you've said you're going to do the sale, you're, you're bound by your word. The Gomorrah goes on and brings a brysa discussing whether that really is so or not. And the Gomorrah comes out and, and says at the end there, So if a person just does a deal 
verbally, orally, it's, it's not binding. But if you retract from your word, the rabbis are not happy with you. It's not, a, it's not a good thing to be doing. So we've now got three levels. We've got the deal isn't done unless there's, unless there's delivery. So legally you're entitled to get out of your word. Then we've got Misha Para, but if you do break your word, there's this terrible curse. You're like the generation of the flood, terribly corrupt. And then we've got the next level. It's not Misha Para, but... The, the, the rabbis don't approve. It's not a nice thing. Rova says that's the only thing we know. I don't know about this thing of the of the curse with the people of the flood. And then the Gemara explains and concludes. If a person has only made a verbal commitment and no money has been paid, then the rabbis aren't happy, but it's not the curse. But the Dvorim Veleka Ba'adayimos, then there's no curse. However, if it's, if it's Ika Ba'adayimos, if he has paid money, Koi Ba'aval, then there is the curse. So the way the Gemara comes out here is, if you just made a verbal commitment, the right thing is to stand by your commitment. The rabbis disapprove of not standing by it. If you've paid money for it, even though technically that's not legally binding because you haven't delivered yet, until delivery legally you can back out of the deal, but if you do so, you compare to the people of the, of the time of the flood, it's corrupt. And then there's the actual, the actual giving of delivery. The question in, in the Rishonim here is around, is this only according to the view of Rabbi Yochanan that Midah or Raisa, according to the Torah, money is a valid form of sealing the deal? The Chachomim took it down a level and said, no, you actually, have to, you actually have to deliver. And then the Chachomim say, but we're also saying, if you've paid money and you've made a commitment, although legally you can still back out, morally you shouldn't do so, and if you do, it's, it's corrupt. But what about according to the view of Reish Lokish, who says money is not a Kenyan at all. It doesn't, when you're dealing with Metalton, when you're dealing with gold and Rolexes, there's only delivery. Money is not a form of a Kenyan. Payment is not a form of Kenyan at all. So now, is this relevant? Do we now say the curse never applies because money is irrelevant? Or do we say the curse applies even if you don't pay money? Because you've taken money out of the picture. That's what Tosfus deals with here. You've taken money out of the picture, according to, to Reish Lokish, right? And Reish Lokish says money is not an issue. When you're dealing with golden Rolexes, money is not part of the process. There's an undertaking and there's delivery. Until there's delivery, you, ha- you can legally back out. Once there's an undertaking, morally you shouldn't back out. But where does the curse apply? Does the curse still apply? Are you still compared to the people of the Dora Mabel? The Rashbo and the Ritvo based on the Rif. Okay, so the Rif, remember, is the, the real father of, of, of modern halacha. Based on the Rif, the Rashbo and the Ritvo, both say shelotiknu mishe para ele b'makom sheyesh kesef shirawi liknot mina Torah. Unless you're dealing according to the view that payment is a Kenyan mid or isa, it's just the rabbanon who said we want you to actually deliver. Unless you're going according to that view, there's no mishe para. So according to the view of, of Reish Lakish, who says money is not payment is not a form of Kenyan at all for for metalsin for movable property. According to that, there's no mishe para. This, this curse of comparing you to the people of the, of the time of the flood, this corruption doesn't apply. It's only according to the view that there is payment, mida or isa, and you've paid, then the Chachomim say you could still get out of it legally, but it's not a good thing to do, and if you are to do it, it's corrupt. There's a beautiful Rimigash. The Rimigash is brought in, in the Shittah Mekubetis. Remember, the Rimigash is Talmud of the Rif, student of the Rif. The Rebbe of the Rambam. He didn't teach the Rambam directly, but he taught the Rambam's father. And the Rambam treats the Rimi Gash as his Rebbe. So the Rimi Gash is the link between the, Ram, between the Rif and the Rambam. The Rimi Gash also institutionalizes the Torah of the Rif when the Rif comes to Spain from North Africa and builds these yeshivas in Spain, which afterwards the Ashbo and the Ritvo, the Rambam, all of these people kind of are, are influenced by this yeshiva there. So the the one understands that the Ritvo and the Rashbo are basing themselves on the Rif, 
say that this only applies according to the view that money plays a role mid or raisa. It's just the rabbis who said, take it out of the picture. The Rimi Gash brings a shaila from somebody. Somebody asked the Rimi Gash, and, and this, the, the Rav who asked the Rimi Gash, this is 200 years before the Rashbo, they asked the Rimi Gash and says, Hayani really mikan she'en chai v'mishi parai, v'davar sh'nit kayim ba'a mekach mena Torah. The only place that mishi parai is applied, the, the question is said, like the Rashbo and the Ritvo would so la- say later on, and like the, the Rif seems to say in any case already at that time, that if there's no money involved and we're not going according to the view of Rabbi Yechelen, there's no Mishya Para. And the, the beautifully, the Rimi Gash goes into it and disagrees. Eina davar kamo she'ala bedaatcha, ela chiyuv Mishya Para, chal v'afilu bedavar she'einu nikne min ha Even if min ha-midorai said there's no Kenyan, there is no legal obligation at all to stand by your word, because you haven't signed anything, because you haven't delivered anything. The deal's not yet done. Still there's a Mishya Para. In Charoiki afilu man desvira lemaot einan konot it le dechayev Mishya Para. So he seems to be going differently to the, to the riff, and he reasons it all out so, so beautifully. And it's important to see that the Rimi Gash is willing to go against the riff. The Rimi Gash, though a Talmud of the riff, is an enormously innovative Rishon. Very early, this is the 11th century we're talking about, beginning of the 12th century. And he thinks for himself and he reasons for himself. And that's the way Talmudim were raised. They weren't told what to think, they were taught how to think. And then they were given license by their rabbeim to use their minds to think, to think accordingly. I was still of that generation. I consider myself to be so privileged to have been at that end of that generation where that's how we were still taught. Not what to think, but how to think. Nowadays, people are taught what to think, not how to think. And, and for, for various reasons. I remember that once uh, asking Marish Yeshiva Shaila, at that time I was already either, I'd taken Smith or was about to take Smith, and I asked a Shaila to Rebelli Mishkovsky, and he, as he always would do, he would say, he wouldn't answer right away, he would say, so, so what do you think? How, how would you answer the question? So I told him what I would think, and he tore me to pieces. He gave me such a, t- he tore me to pieces. So I said, thank you. And then he said, so what are you, what's, what's your decision? I said, well, you've made it very clear. He said, no, that's my decision. I made my clear decision clear. What's your decision? I don't want you just to do what I, what, what I think and to Paskin the way I Paskin. Now you go back and you rethink using everything I've taught you. And if after that you still think the way you think, then do it. Go your way. You don't have to do what I tell you. That's how we were taught. That's how we were taught. Think for yourself. This is how you think. I've mentioned to you before, Rav Moshe Feinstein, on a very difficult shayla that I gave him once, said, I won't pass him for that because I don't know the, con- the, the circumstances. I don't know the context in South Africa well enough. All I can do is teach you the principles and you have to apply it. And how you apply it, that's the way it needs to be applied. And you see the, the Rimi Gash, the Talmud of the Rif, willing to learn the Gemara differently. Using the way his Rebbe taught him how to learn, but using the methodology, you come to a different conclusion because we're all different. And so he reasons it th- throughout, and he explains why. And he says, Anybody who has the capacity to carry out his word, because he owns the object, so he could sell it, he could deliver it, is worthy of a mishekara. Because it's trustworthiness and honesty that requires that you're punished for not for not fulfilling, you, fulfilling your word. You're obligated to finish what you said. In other words, the Rimigash sees the action as the completion of the statement. You can't just say, well, I only said so. I didn't mean it. Or I didn't. If you said so, you've begun the process. If you've said to somebody, I will sell my house to you, you've already begun the process. And you've got you've got to execute because you said you would. Are you legally required to? No. Are you legally able to back out of the deal? Yes. Ethically, can you back out of the deal? No. And even a person who has no legal obligation at all, he just said he would do it. If he doesn't do it, he's compared to the people of Dora Mabul. And, and in this price, it's not only Dora Mabul, Manshe Dora Flaga, Manshe Sedom Vaamora, Umimitsraim Bayam. The Brysa says, you're as bad as all of those terrible people. The people of the, of the flood and the people of the Hadar Aflaga and the people of uh, Sdom and Amora and the people of Mitzrayim. Why are you so terrible? Legally, you're allowed to get out of it. You haven't signed anything. 
says the Tosfos Harosh, Shehayu meleim Hamas v'lo hayu omdim b'diburam. The people of the Dor HaMabu were full of Hamas. And Hamas is you don't keep your word. Have you ever come across Hamas like that? People who don't keep their word. That, that's what Hamas means. Although the other Mephoshim in Bereshis learn it differently. V'dor ha'aflaga nakata gav dor ha'mabu. And dor ha'aflaga fits into the same category. U'mitzrayim lo ayu omdim b'diburayim. Shebechul sh'ayu omdim l'shalech et Yisrael v'chazru bayim. What's the story of Mitzrayim and Paro? Yes, we'll send you out. Now I've changed my mind. Please daven for me. Let Well, we'll send you out. Now I've changed my mind. That was a great example of, of Mishe Paro. So what you see here is amazingly it's shocking. The Rebun Shem's terrible punishment of Paro and Mitzrayim and his terrible punishment of the people of the Dor Aflaga was not for all the other bad things they did. They did many bad things. The real punishment was for lack of integrity, for not keeping their word. What a chidush this is. You can talk about it at your seder. That all of that punishment, the ten makos, was not for throwing babies into the river. The ten makos was not for, for enslaving the Jews. The ten makos was not standing by your word. Misha para. And so it was with the Mabu. And if you look at, at Reb Shemishun Rafael Hirsch and his explaining of Vatimalei Haaretz Hamas, asks the Reb Shemishun Rafael Hirsch, it doesn't say Vatimalei Haaretz Hashchata, the world was full of corruption. It's Vatimalei Haaretz Hamas, because he defines Hamas as Asiyat Ra Lezulat Ba'orma, when you do evil deceitfully. That's when it's, that's Hamas. <coughs> Horeset achevra, and that destroys society. So, vatimaleya aretz Hamas, the whole society was filled with Hamas. It's not criminal activity. He says, Shimshon Rafael Hirsch, criminal activity does not poison a society. What, what makes a society toxic is unethical activity. And the reason he says is because criminal activity, there's a system to deal with it. The courts and the police, they, they can deal with it. And eventually people are aware that it's wrong. You can't go through life in a society and say, I didn't know you're not allowed to steal. I didn't know you're not allowed to murder. How many times did you read in the newspaper people are being locked up into jail for doing these things? You can't say, I didn't know. But just a lack of ethics. Nobody's locked up in jail for not keeping their word. Didn't sign anything, didn't do a Kenyan. I've just decided to change my mind. The market's changed. Okay, what can you do? Nobody's put into jail for that. And because nobody's put into jail for that, people don't realize how serious it is. And if people don't realize how serious it is, it infiltrates into the way the society operates. And so unethical behavior is more destructive for society than criminal behavior. And that's why the Rebbe Nishim responds so, bad, so, so vehemently to unethical behavior. There's specific onshim for criminal behavior. But for unethical behavior, the whole society has to be terminated. As he terminated it in the time of the flood, and he terminated Egyptian society. Because an unethical society can't continue to exist. It has to fall apart. A criminal society can still do tshuva, an unethical society never will. And that's why if a person breaks his word, he's compared to the Dor HaMabul. There's no, there's no punishment for you. You don't go to court. Uh, somebody can't take you to court and extract payment. You don't go to jail for it. But you're compared to, compared to the Dor HaMabul and Dor HaFlaga and the Dor Mitzrayim and Sdom Vamora, because that's the essence of corruption. When it's something that is subtle and not clear enough to you, you allow it to perpetrate in, in the entire society and you destroy not only yourself and your own relationships, but you're actually destroying and poisoning the society in which you live. That's the power of the Jew, of the person, to be a, a, a a Baal Emuna or a Baal Amana, to be somebody who's trustworthy and honest and therefore a pillar of society, enabling society to continue and to prosper. Mm -hmm.